Roughly 9 hours by train from Tbilisi through mostly desert and bare hills with a Persian desert type of climate. But during night time, in a train with air conditioning, drinks on board and civilized smoking area. So it's not that bad. Welcome to Yerevan. Let's explore. Hello everyone and welcome to the fourth and final featured installment of the Hungary-Georgia-Armenia tour. Oh Yerevan, just a few more kilometers south and you're in Turkey, or a few extra kilometers southeast and you're in Iran. This city is basically the last bastion of the Western civilization before the emptiness of the Middle East begins. You can see it even inside the city. The more south you go into the city, the fewer the elements of European civilization are noticeable. Geography really doesn't help this place either. As Dr. Thomas Sowell explained in Wealth, Poverty and Politics back in 2015, geography is an immutable factor that has serious implications on long-term poverty and economic performance in general. This is very clear at every step when you're in Armenia. Located right next to Turkey, which Armenians regard as Western Armenia or occupied territory, more on that later, and also next to the Islamic Republic of Iran and also next to Azerbaijan, Armenia is a place that is geographically locked. The border with Turkey is completely closed. So is the border with Azerbaijan. Trade with Iran is rather limited. So the only way to get to Armenia is through Georgia, which is the only neighbor that did not try at some point in time to exterminate all of the Armenians or try to steal some of their land. Once you understand that, it becomes much easier to grasp why Armenia is by far the least economically developed country of the entire area or why Yerevan, most of the time, doesn't have the air of a capital city. Finding a grocery store outside the central area is hard, because they don't exist, and most of the neighborhoods are rarely, if ever, visited by the tourists. And not because they're dangerous or anything, they really aren't, because I went there, but because there's nothing to do there. So the locals are quite surprised to meet tourists in those areas. With that said, there's no way you'll tell an Armenian you need help and leave empty-handed. They'll go out of their way to help you, and at the end, they will thank you for visiting Armenia. And of course, they'll recommend you to taste some of their alcohol. But more on that later. By the end of this video, hopefully, you'll be planning to come here as well. As was the case with Georgia, this country comes with a shockingly low point when you first get in, and by the time you're due to leave, you're already doing the math in your head to see how fast you can get back here and spend more time in this place. Clearly, three days here were nowhere near enough. Yerevan and the surrounding area has more history in it than many of the nations we consider old and established. Founded in 782 BC as Yerebuni, the Armenian capital is one of the oldest continuously inhabited cities in the world, older than Rome itself, 
although still young when compared to the oldest cities still inhabited in the world such as Zadar, Croatia, Nicosia, Cyprus or Cadiz, Spain. Nevertheless, Yerevan is one of those hidden gems that no serious traveler should miss. Going around the city via public transport is only occasionally a good idea, namely if the landmark you're looking for is very close to a trolley bus station or a metro station, which is rarely the case. Otherwise, the cab is by far the best option if you can negotiate in Russian. In the Caucasus, and particularly in Armenia, these kinds of services are always negotiated. So for the first landmark, the Armenian Genocide Memorial will take the cab from the city center at the Republican Square or Ploshchiad Respubliki in Russian or locally the Hraparak, if you can remember that name, which I couldn't. So this is where you'll get uh, the best taxi fares to go up on the hill where the memorial is located. Oh and yeah, everything interesting is up on a hill somewhere. This is one of the reasons the city survived almost 3000 years because it was well defended naturally. The Armenian Genocide Memorial Complex, known locally as Tsitsernaka Berd, after the name of the hill it is located on, is a gigantic recollection place of the deepest wound of the Armenian people. The memorial itself was built by the Soviet Union in 1967, but the research center and the what is known as the Museum Institute only opened in 1995, showing once again that even the atrocities that the Soviet Union did recognize were still next to impossible to talk about. The Armenian Genocide is the series of actions taken by the Ottoman Empire against the Armenian population which at the time lived in the falling empire between 1915 and 1923 when the late Ottoman authorities conducted a series of actions coming from deportation, mass murder, ethnic targeting and starvation specifically against the Armenian population of the empire. Such actions amount to genocide in the opinion of pretty much everyone but as usual Politics begs to differ. While the facts of the matter are not really contested by anyone, the use of the word genocide is still controversial in many circles, mostly for political reasons, which is really just a nice way of saying we don't want to alienate Turkey because Turkey is a NATO member. Although the Armenians were the most targeted uh, population in that period, other populations from the late Ottoman Empire suffered too, specifically the Assyrians and the Greeks, which many scholars consider as part of the same event, which also led to the designation of the 1915-23 events as the Other Holocaust or the Armenian Holocaust. It is difficult to overstate just how much of a negative impact this series of events has had on the Armenian people. Whereas up until 1915 Armenians were a thriving population, after the genocide the Armenian people became fractured, poorer than perhaps ever before and for many decades barely acknowledged to even exist, though the latter is mostly due to the fact that the newly created Armenian Republic was soon absorbed into the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. While the Intermarium has had a constant Armenian population even before the genocide, as I've shown you in the videos from Western Ukraine where the arts community was dominated by Armenians in the late 19th century, most of the present-day Armenian diaspora exists almost entirely because of the Armenian genocide. So it is thus no surprise that this series of events is still heavily commemorated and remembered. There are still about 100 survivors still alive today all of them in the diaspora. The 
The Armenian Genocide is a good example on how lack of morals in politics leads to schizophrenic results. For instance, my own country, Romania, doesn't officially recognize the Armenian Genocide, even though most of the Armenian minority in Romania exists solely because the Romanian Kingdom was open to receiving refugees fleeing from Ottoman oppression. More so, there are descendants of those refugees serving as members of the parliament today, yet for some reason, official recognition has not happened. And this despite the fact that Ioan Iliescu, while serving as the president of Romania, is one of the world leaders who did plant a tree at the genocide memorial. As I said, politics can sometimes be schizophrenic indeed. The Armenian Genocide is of relevance because it served as an inspiration for what was later to be known as the Holocaust committed by the National Socialist regime in Germany, primarily against its Jewish population but also against gypsies, homosexuals and other minorities. Now, I said earlier that prior to the Armenian Genocide, the Armenian people were a thriving population. Just how thriving we get to take a glimpse at the Mate Nadaran, officially known as the Mesrop Mashtots Institute of Ancient Manuscripts, named after the famous Armenian medieval linguist, theologian and statesman who also invented the Armenian alph alphabet as well as the Georgian alphabet and the Caucasian Albanian alphabet, which is no longer in use today. The Institute of Ancient Manuscripts is not just a museum, it's a wholesome research center where manuscripts are being translated, restored and analyzed. And it's not just Armenian manuscripts either, it's also manuscripts from Persia or modern-day Iran, modern-day Kazakhstan, the Mesopotamian area and beyond, although the focus is, of course, on manuscripts written by Armenians. This place is totally worth visiting with the guided tour which are available in Armenian, Russian, English, Italian, Spanish, French, German and Arabic language. Taking pictures inside is essentially not allowed because the no-flash rule makes it impossible to take proper pictures, but videotaping is allowed for a fee of about $6 per person. The variety of manuscripts available tell the story of how advanced the Armenians were compared to other peoples at identical points in history. There's manuscripts on geometry, philosophy, history, medicine, literature, art history, cosmography and of course 
theology. And by theology, I don't just mean translations of the Bible or later on the Quran, but treatises on theology and books which are part of the long debates that occurred in this area of the world following the First Council of Nicaea, the First Council of Constantinople, and the Council of Ephesus. Many of these manuscripts contributed to how the Christian doctrine ended up being interpreted by essentially the whole of Christendom. Please bear in mind that all of this is pre-1054 AD schism, so most of these documents are accepted even today by all traditional churches, namely the Eastern Orthodox Church, the Oriental Apostolic Orthodox Church, the Roman Catholic Church and the Assyrian Church of the East. A funny moment while visiting this museum is when you get to the translations of the Quran when the guide insists that the translations were made for research and familiarization purposes amongst the scholars and most definitely not as an encouragement for Armenians to become Muslims. Such moments are a firm reminder that while you're just a few kilometers away from Iran, you're still firmly within the Christian civilization. This place is considered the central Matin Adaran, as the guide explained to me, whereas other places with ancient manuscripts, also called Matin Adaran, exist essentially in every place in the world where there is an Armenian presence. That's how I found out that there are quite a few of such places right here in Romania, although none in Hungary, as apparently the Armenian presence didn't last long enough there to establish one. While touring this place, you'll hear two syntaxes quite often the Armenian Genocide and the Soviet Union. One of these two, and oftentimes both of these syntagms, emerge whenever there is a question of missing manuscripts. Because the Armenian Genocide didn't just mean the systemic murder of 1.5 million Armenians, but it also meant the complete eradication of any sign that Armenians ever existed in the territories that are today known as Anatolia or Eastern Turkey, places, again, still called Western Armenia, especially in this institution. The Ottoman Empire made sure to destroy all of the churches and burn all of the manuscripts that were left behind when the Armenian population was being marched on through the desert, thus obliterating a significant portion of the Armenian history. This wound is even bigger because most of the important scholarly centers of the Middle Ages Armenia were located to the west of the Ararat mountain in what is today modern Turkey. So basically this spot in Adaran is the collection of what was left to the east of Ararat in modern day Armenia. To make things worse, Armenia was double crossed by Russia the same way my own country was during World War I. The beginning of World War I and the Armenian Genocide worried many Armenian scholars, so they sent most of the manuscripts they had gathered up to that point to Moscow for preservation. Fast forward several years later, the Bolshevik Revolution happens, the war ends, the Armenian Genocide still continues for several more years, and the new Bolshevik authorities decide to forget to return the manuscripts to Yerevan. Moreover, in 1920, the Bolsheviks decide to also confiscate other manuscripts previously held at the headquarters of the Armenian Apostolic Church at Etchimiatsin. Some of those were returned in 1922, but many were lost forever, just like many other items of culture which were made disappeared by the large cultural masticator that the Soviet Union was.
A proper visit to the Mashtots Matenadaran will take you at least three hours, but it is totally worth it because you'll learn more about Armenian history than the National History Museum, which not only completely forbids videotaping and photography, but also lacks guided tours. Eh, it's a common frustration for me, so maybe I should stop complaining. At the exit of the Maten Adran, there is also an open-air display of the Armenian alphabet, which, as a strictly personal opinion, looks much easier to learn than the Georgian one. Probably helps that Armenian is, after all, an Indo-European language and the pronunciation sounds nowhere near as difficult as the one in Georgia. But that's a topic for another day. Alright, so after Martin Adaran, we'll walk towards what is locally known as the Cascade, which is not a cascade, but a huge park with huge stairs. Yes, stairs. This tour made me, made me lose some weight, since every city in this tour contained lots and lots of stairs. The good news is that at the Cascade, you can cheat and take the escalator if you go before 8pm. The bad news is that, in theory, videotaping is forbidden. Of course, that doesn't mean videotaping is actually forbidden, you just need to avoid the minders and not have a huge camera. <laughs> At the basis of the Cascade, there is an open-air modern art museum with original works of various mostly contemporary modern artists, both from Armenia and from abroad, mostly from Europe. Now, it should be no surprise that such thing exists in Yerevan. If you remember my videos from Transcarpathia, it was an Armenian artist named Shimon Holoshi who founded one of the first European schools of modern art, the Bayamare school, born out of Holoshi's frustration with the rigidity of the German and Hungarian art schools. Now, I'm not an expert in art by any stretch of the imagination, least of all modern art, yet I will still say that if Shimon Holoshi had been alive today, he might be tempted to issue an apology for pushing modern art. Nevertheless, many of the exhibits are in the line with the initial view of modern art, namely that it doesn't abide by the rigidity of the more traditional schools, but it is still aesthetic.
If you're climbing using the indoor escalator, you also get to admire even more modern art exhibits, basically for free, but again, be aware that taking pictures is technically forbidden. Climbing up the whole cascade is totally worth it for the view and it also shortens the trip towards the Victory Park. Admittedly, not the most mainstream route, as I had to walk next to a busy highway without a sidewalk, apparently nobody really just walks up to the Victory Park, but still a good choice since I wanted to cram as many landmarks as possible within the same day. Because again, allotting only three days for Yerevan was clearly a mistake, though the budget had a lot to do with it. The Victory Park, or the Hachtanag, is one of the, those places with which Armenians have a love-hate relationship. On one hand, it's the park built by the Soviet Union to prop up its might amongst the Armenians, including by putting a huge statue of Stalin in the middle of it, and on the other hand, it is today one of the large spaces where you can take a walk in the extremely hot, hot days, which is every day during August when I was here, that has also been made friendly for families and children while most of the communist symbols were taken apart. Ish. Stalin's statue was replaced with Mayir Hayastan, or Mother Armenia, as early as 1962, making it, to my knowledge, one of the few places in the former Soviet Union where a statue of Stalin was taken down with the full approval of the communist authorities and also replaced with a nationalistic symbol. The symbolism is pretty straightforward. Peace through strength, which is very fitting for a people that has suffered so much. The fact that the statue is female is also not coincidental, as in Armenia it was not uncommon for women to take up arms since most of the time the foes of Armenians would target everybody anyway, so you'd either defend yourself or disappear. Armenia simply existing today is a testament of the bravery and resilience of these people. From up here you get an even better view of the whole city and if you happen to be here during the sunset, it's just lovely. Also from up here it becomes more obvious just how old Yerevan is, with parts of the city having an obviously previous era layout, while others resembling more with other former Eastern Bloc cities.
All right, so now let's head outside the Erevan to see something you can't really see anywhere in Europe. In fact, most of the awesome things in Yerevan are actually in the greater Yerevan area and dozens of kilometers outside Yerevan proper. To someone traveling like me, that's quite a problem since Armenia only recently opened its borders for foreign tourists, so there isn't yet a proper organized and reliable public transport option to most of these landmarks. So you're left with either renting a car or booking a tour, both pretty expensive as options because fuel is brutally expensive in Armenia. Moreover, as a solo traveler, booking tours is quite pricey because the private services that do exist are geared for tourists who travel as a group of at least three or four people. But what can you do? So I booked a selected custom-made smaller tour that fit my budget and included the exact two things that I promised in the fundraiser. So the first stop is the Garni Temple in the village of Garni, about 25 kilometers from Yerevan city center. The Garni Temple is an Ionic temple and the only standing Greek or Roman colonnaded uh, building in Armenia and the former Soviet Union in general. Although not the only one, Garni Temple is the best known structure dating from pre-Christian Armenia. As a short reminder, Armenia is the first country in the world to adopt Christianity as a national religion in the year 301 Anno Domini. The Garni Temple was first uh, built by King uh, Tiridates I around the year 80 AD, that is 8-0 Anno Domini. The temple is believed to have been built as dedicated to the deity of the light of heaven and the god of truth, Mihr, in ancient Armenian mythology. The temple was converted into a royal summer house after Armenia's conversion to Christianity and then served other peripheral purposes until 1679 when it was destroyed by an earthquake. Some scholars disagree with this and assert that the Garni temple wasn't actually a temple at all but a tomb in this, and is thus the reason it survived the nearly universal destruction of pagan structures that followed after Armenia's conversion to Christianity. Honestly, both versions seem plausible, although the structure itself does resemble more of a temple than a tomb if I am to compare with other Greek or Roman structures of the same period. Nevertheless, after it fell to the 1679 earthquake, for about 200 years everyone forgot about it until the 19th century, when the scholars at the time revived the interest for the site and in early 1900s excavations began with a view to eventually reconstruct the structure using the original materials and construction techniques. Then war, genocide and the Soviet terror happened, so the eventual reconstruction was postponed for several more decades until 1969, when the work finally began, finishing in 1975. Today it is one of the main tourist attractions in Armenia, but it also serves as something close to its original purpose. 
Few people know that Garni is the central shrine of Hetanism, which is a reconstructionist neo-pagan religion meant to constitute an ethnic religion specifically for Armenians. Hetanism, or the Order of the Children of Arai, was founded in 1991 as one of the many efforts of national reawakening after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Make no mistake, Hetanism is not some edgy hippies in a corner believing they're so cool or anything like that. <laughs> Ashot Navasadian, the founder of the Armenian Republican Party, which is the political party in power today in Armenia, was a Hetan. Former Prime Minister Andranik Margarian was also a sympathizer and helped with the publishing of the first modern version of Hetanism's Book of Vows. Pagan festivals are being held here, particularly on the Pagan New Year, which is on March the 21st, and also during summertime on Vardavar, or the Water Day, a tradition that has also been included into Christianity, but has a much older pagan tradition. Just like Christian Armenians take their orthodoxy very seriously, so do the Armenian pagans, who also take their reconstructionist religion very seriously. Eh, it's a very long story and an interesting topic for those who take religious studies seriously. Alright, now that I've shown you a pagan temple, let me show you an impressive Christian structure as well. When I said on social media that you don't get to see anything like this in Europe, people rush to show me examples of churches carved in mountains. Kids, please, none of those in Europe are even remotely comparable with the Gegardavank or the Monastery of the Spear, named after the spear which had wounded Jesus at the crucifixion, allegedly brought to Armenia by Apostle Jude, in Armenia known as Tadeus, and stored amongst many other relics. Now, the Gegard Monastery is in fact a monasterial complex and not just a single monastery, and it is by far the most spectacular religious structure that I have personally seen so far, though in 2018 I might show you comparable structures. The whole area is a UNESCO World Heritage Site, and for good reason. The main chapel was built in 1215 AD, but the monastery itself is founded in the 4th century by Grigor Lusavrich, or Gregory the Illuminator, the patron saint and the first official head of the Armenian Apostolic Church. The original structure built around the site of founding was destroyed during one of the early Islamic invasions. So in the late 12th century, the work uh, to build this complex began, which upon completion resisted to essentially all Islamic invasions that came afterwards. The complex contained several churches and even churches within the churches, which throughout the century served as places of hiding and worship while the Islamic forces were raiding the area. By far the most interesting portion in this church, carved inside the mountain on top of the biggest church, which is partially visible from the outside. Now, this adjacent church, if you want, served both as a place of hiding and as a launching pad of rocks and arrows, as the main church was basically a trap for various invaders. It would take a separate video just to list how many times this compound was raided, pillaged and robbed, but suffice to say that the reason there isn't much applied art in the complex is because none of it survived. 
Nevertheless, until the 1600s, just like the Gelati monastery complex in Georgia that I've shown you in the previous video of this series, Gegard was more than just a religious site. It was a scholarly center in which manuscripts were transcribed, translated and verified, as well as a center to which regular people and poorer scholars could come to study and or worship. Moreover, until mid-17th century, Gegard was also routinely patronized by the nobility, not just with money, but also with ancient manuscripts from various private collections that were donated for the purpose of further study and scholarly work. In a way, the role of a deposit of old Armenian artifacts has been revived with the bringing of these copies of Hachkar's tombstones from the Armenian cemetery in Yulfa, previously located in the Nakhchivan exclave of Azerbaijan. The Yulfa cemetery originally housed around 10,000 funerary mo monuments. The tombstones consisted mainly of thousands of Hachkar's uniquely decorated cross stones characteristic of medieval Christian Armenian art. That particular cemetery, being on the territory of Azerbaijan, was destroyed in mid-2000s by the Azerbaijani authorities and turned into a military shooting range. Eh, long story, I won't get into that controversy this time. Suffice to say that a visit to Gegard, and Garni for that matter, gives you a much thorough and lasting image of just how old the Armenian civilization actually is, and just how profound the Christian identity indeed is in this country. In many ways, if you're an admirer of Christian civilization, you're much more home in Armenia than you are in Sweden. And I say this after visiting both countries during the summer of 2017. Alright, now let's get back to Yerevan and take a walk on the city's largest pedestrian street, the Northern Avenue, and have an Obama coffee. No, seriously, I'm not joking. This avenue, opened in 2007, is one of the areas that makes Yerevan more like a capital city, but as I was saying at the beginning of this presentation, most of the time, in most of the cases, Yerevan doesn't feel like a capital city. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, although it does speak a lot about the economic hardship of the country, mostly due to the geographical and geopolitical situation in which Armenia finds itself in. But, as I also said at the beginning, it is the people in this country that are slowly but consistently making the place great again. A lot less warm and open than the Georgians, everyday Armenians come off as fundamentally good people who've been through a lot. A long walk through Yerevan will not reveal a depressed people, but a people that is cautiously optimistic at best. Which makes perfect sense, since although things are getting visibly better, there are still reasons to abstain from unfettered optimism. Transportation is still in its infancy. The Yerevan Central Railway Station features exactly two trains. A local train that takes one close to the border with Iran, and the train I used to get to, into Armenia. A night-long range train that goes from Yerevan to Batumi in Georgia at the Black Sea. The rest of the transportation is done via the marshrutkas, which are basically minibuses acting as share taxis. Maxi taxi, as they're known in the Intermario. Although this form of transportation exists in various forms all over the former Eastern Bloc, as well as in Finland and Central Asia, they exist alongside more developed forms of transportation. In Armenia, for now at least, the Marshrutka remains the main form of public transport, especially considering that fuel is expensive in Armenia, 
again, mostly due to geopolitical reasons, and thus car ownership is still quite low. With that said, the future of Armenia looks much brighter than, for instance, France's. Armenia ranks way ahead France, Italy, Portugal, Spain or Greece in terms of economic freedom. In fact, out of the countries of the former Eastern Bloc, only Latvia and Lithuania are ranked better than Armenia in terms of economic freedom, all three of them being in the mostly free cohort. The roads are also in a remarkably good condition. Also, the service sector is getting visibly better day by day and there is a growing financial sector as Armenia is one of the few places completely open for investment for both Eastern and Western investors. The government takes an entirely laissez-faire attitude to most things. For instance, the government doesn't even keep track of how much the private sector spends on research and development, except military research, of course. To make things even better, Armenia is experiencing sustained population growth with essentially zero immigration and minuscule levels of emigration. Like all other countries in the former Eastern Bloc, Armenia has suffered a sustained population decline following the fall of the Soviet Union, mostly due to emigration, but all that trend was reversed in the last seven or eight years and alongside the development of private healthcare, life expectancy has also dramatically increased. And last but not least, a dedicated diaspora, which is, and will continue to be for the foreseeable future, part of the process of building a superior future for Armenia. The Armenian diaspora counts on at least 8 million individuals, 1 million just in the United States alone, far outpacing the population of 3 million within Armenia itself. And, for the most part, that diaspora does look after its home country, and that's something to keep in mind when thinking about the future of Armenia. Sure, it's far from perfect and there's a lot to be done, but for the first time in the last 100 years, there is also the possibility of doing, something which the Armenian people lacked for the last 100 years or so. I for one am glad I got to see Armenia now as it is beginning its transformation and, as I said at the beginning of the video, clearly three days here were nowhere near enough. And I do hope I'll get to come back to Yerevan and spend more time in this country. Getting into Armenia legally is not complicated. Unlike Georgia, citizens of the European Union and the Schengen Agreement do need a valid passport to get in. Also, citizens of all the countries of the former Soviet Union, as well as Brazil, Argentina, Iran, Israel, Norway, Switzerland, Japan, the United States and Uruguay, don't require a pre-approved visa or any form of visa to get in for 180 days per year. Additionally, citizens of Canada, India, China, Turkey, Mexico, the Australasian area, the non-EU West Balkans countries, Jordan and the United Arab Emirates can get visa on arrival for a 6 or $7 fee uh, for a 21 days visa or about $32 for a 120 days visa. Everyone else, though, needs a visa in advance. So, to sum up, Armenia is a country that, at the edge of the Western civilization, is trying to rise back to prosperity after its people has been heavily and continuously oppressed for the last 100 years and are doing so with dignity and patience. And it works. There are many things that can be argued about the Armenian people, but one thing that cannot be seriously disputed is their hard work. Just like the Georgians, Armenians don't shy away from hard work while still maintaining a level of generosity rarely found in other places. At one moment I got lost and asked for directions. Suddenly four different people gathered around me to try to help. 
and they did eventually. One was decent enough in English, but didn't quite know the town well enough to guide me. Another knew the town very well, but spoke neither English nor Russian. The third acted as a translator, while the fourth was running around trying to get a hold of a bus driver or a cabbie to ask for further clarification. And this happened three times during my stay in Yerevan. Random people to suddenly interrupt their day to help a tourist with a camera for more than half an hour? That's not common in my long experience as a solo traveler to places where no one else goes. So it is thus my conviction that it is the hard work and the generosity of the Armenian people that I got to experience firsthand that will be the main engine of, well, making Armenia great again. So with that, this concludes the featured series of the Hungary-Georgia-Armenia tour and marks the end of 2017 travel videos. I hope you all enjoyed it and will support more of this in 2018. More on that on January the 1st. After Yerevan, I boarded the same train that got me here and then traveled for two days straight, from Yerevan to Tbilisi, from there to Kutaisi with another train and then flew back to Budapest and then another train back to my hometown. It's been a long journey, but it was totally worth it and, more importantly, would do it again. And likely will do it again. So with all of that being said, thank you all for watching. Thank you to all of those who supported this tour and the general work that we do here on Freedom Alternative. And please do consider a small donation if you derive any value from all of this. And I'll see you all very soon on Freedom Alternative. Merry Christmas, everyone.